Hello, hello. Yes, good. Good morning. Um, I'm going to try and speak for about nine minutes, and then I want two people to ask me a question. All right? So the rest of you can be on your smartphones, but at least two of you, could you look at one of the slides and ask me one question? That, for me, will define success. All right, so I want to talk to you about some work that we've almost finished. Uh, I can't show you numbers. I'm going to say a few of them. Uh, we're going to have this all, all wrapped up in about six weeks, and then we're going to come and talk to some airlines about it. OK, so let's talk about what we did and why. What's the background here? So we always talk about channel shifts. We talk about them in the aggregate. Um, we talk about the cost of a channel. We talk about the GDSs. We talk about the OTAs. We talk about all these things. We talk about percentages. We sit around management tables, and, and we do all of that. Fine. Decision making inside an airline is very disjointed. Finance works on, on a budget cycle. The guys on distribution talk about the multi-year contracts that they'll have with the GDSs. You'll have some small ad hoc negotiations. The route and the network guys will, will be on different cycles. However, this is not understood. Like, it's never all put together. Like, I personally, I've never sat in, a, in an executive suite in an airline where we talk about the fixed overhead of the marketing team and the GDS and the OTA and the search charge and, and, and. It's never put together. We have these very partial discussions. And so following the money allows us to drive more insight. And so the exam question we set ourselves, we took three large European countries, and we said, let's find out what the true distribution costs all the way through from soup to nuts, as we say, in, in the UK would be. And we looked at about 50 billion euros of sales. So we took 50 billion euros of airline revenue on a ticket by ticket basis, and we traced it all the way through. And I wanted to share some of that with you. We also looked at hotels. So which consolidation curve is airlines and which one is hotels? The top one is airlines, the bottom one is hotels. So in case you're wondering why the uh, OTAs can extract commissions that are three or four times higher out of hotels than out of airlines, this is why. If you're a hotel, you don't have a lot of negotiating power. OK. Why else is this important? Well, because airlines don't really spend much money. So if you look at marketing spend as a percentage of revenues, you just get these very different pictures. The hotels do a bit more, but nothing compared to the big players. And the big players are pushing into loyalty. Personally, as a former airline exec, this I find very, very worrying. Because we always used to say, it's OK. They love us for our loyalty plan. It's all going to be good. But if the OTA is now saying, we've got our loyalty plan, then people stop caring about which airline they fly with because they're going to get some good points. They don't care what hotel they stay at. They're going to get points. How did we put all this together? OK, we started with lots of data, of course. We're consultants. We couldn't resist. So for airlines, we took about half a billion fares. We also did a, across a few years. I'm, I'm not going to show that today. Over on the hotel side, we looked about one and a half billion. And then we put in, into statistics. We did research. We did expert interviews. And we mapped the whole thing out. The channels, when we know this is just airlines, you've got your travelers, retail, non-retail, online and offline. Some customers, some travelers do lots of research. And then they go through. They go through the airlines.com. They might get there through paid or unpaid. They go through the OTAs. They go through the TAs or the TMCs. And so go through a surprising number through the more direct channels that are offline, all right? Then you go through GDS for some of this. And then here you are at the bottom. And there is a CRS charge. Again, one of these costs that no one wants to talk about because it's sort of forgotten. It's in a different cost bucket. But it's there. It's real. You're actually paying for it. And it is very different across the airlines. These are not real numbers. You can take all the photos you want, but I've masked them. But this is where we get to, to one airline. We get to the place where, for every single channel, we use financial reports of the airline, so we build up the cost base. We have to make estimates, of course. We have to make estimates. There are lots of different kinds of costs. There's personnel costs. You might have your digital team, your IT team, you have your marketing guys, you have your outstation guys, right? You've got your marketing teams in the outstations. You might have search, you might pay for search. Sometimes you don't pay for search. Depending on how much you sell on credit cards, you get different things. So as you can see, as you start to put everything together, you might get a much better sense of how much does it really cost you to distribute. Okay? And this is across the entire cost bar of the airline. So what that allows us to do is to put this map together, where in each of these boxes, there's a real number. 
So we start with about 47 billion, and then you can see exactly how much goes into each of these. And you can see exactly how much is being taken at each stage by the different players. Now, we don't have all the data, but we can make some estimates, right? So if you're wondering how much business you do, we can't see it on the outside. When we do this with our clients, though, we know exactly how much they're paying. And that's when it really gets interesting. So on it goes, through the channels, through the GDS, and down to net airline revenues. And it's at the net that it really matters. OK, it's at the net that it really matters. And the gap between the two in these countries is about a couple of billion euros. So there's a couple of billion euros just for these airlines. This wasn't all of Europe. We've done that afterwards, but we're just beginning with these three. So that's the money going. Now, this is not wasted money. I don't think for a minute that I'm saying that it's not good, that we're paying for distribution as airlines. This is great. Of course we should, right? We, airlines can't do it all by themselves. But the question is, are you paying the right amount? Yeah, are you funneling in the right way? This is not, I just want to make it very clear, this is not an issue about full content. That's actually a slightly separate con conversation, okay? That's a sort of channel management. But the question is actually much broader than that. So we then cross this, and we then take every single ticket, okay? And then because we know which channel every ticket was sold through, and different channels sell at different fair points, and different ancillaries, different ancillaries are sold through different channels. Again, some of this is estimates. It's outside in, right? With our actual clients, we can do this in more detail. So were the conclusions surprising? And I think the answer was yes. We, we didn't find what we expected to find. Always quite healthy and quite humbling for consultants um, to be proven wrong. And so I've mapped this out. These are three real examples of three real airlines. I'm not going to go into specifics, but what we did for each airline is you can then, for every region and for every channel, and on premium and non-premium, you can say, does it make sense for me to sell through this channel? Okay, so just to be clear, we took each ticket, each passenger with point of sale out of these countries on 50 billion of revenue, and we looked at that fare and the channel and the specific airline and how much it cost, and we know the route results. We injected route profitability. We have a lot of data we can do outside in on route prof. So we mapped every passenger onto the route with a specific distribution cost so we can actually outside in. Surprisingly, we could tell any airline exactly how profitable not only each route was, but every passenger on the route. This is what it looks like. OK, so for this airline, there are regions, premium and non-premium. We just did a forced ranking of all the of, of, of all the boxes, high, medium, low. But what's interesting to us is that it looks different from this airline to this airline to this airline. And that is what we were not expecting. We were expecting far more convergence. We thought it would not be that unique for each airline. We expected that, broadly speaking, the same region with the same channel would give roughly the same result. It's just not true. And so this brings us to what we do when we work with our airline customers and how we are thinking about this with them internally. And the way we're thinking about this, I would say, is profoundly boring. Okay? The last two slides are really not interesting. We've had some real gurus up on stage talking about digital, about data, and all of this amazing stuff. Okay? I've not shown you anything very sexy. I've shown you outside in data. And we did this on, uh, we did not do this on Excel. We did this using far more powerful tools. But again, this is nothing like the complexity of data manipulation that you find on an OEM. But what we did find is that fundamentally, airlines really struggle to talk about this. They struggle to actually get a grip on this. OK, why? Well, there are five groups that need to be pushed together. Maybe two of these are pushed together, but very, very rarely. So to maximize net revenues, most important group, which very rarely comes to the table, is finance. Yes, the supposedly boring gray accountants in finance. Actually, they're far more important to getting this right. Okay, they're very cost-focused, but they have a very different point of view on the overheads and the, and, and the variable costs. Okay, they literally have separate conversations. There's probably separate committees looking at overhead costs versus variable costs. All right? It's just how an airline works. You need the marketing guys. Well, marketing is trying to solve for lots of things. Okay? They're trying to 
calculate share of mind. They're trying to get, I mean, some of the marketing K KPIs, I mean, I'm boring. I'm like a strategy route airline, a sort of fleet guy. Like, I, I don't even understand what marketing's doing. But they're doing it. They're working hard. It's very valuable. And they're deciding where you put the spend. You've got the RevMan guys. Well, RevMan is focusing on gross. They're mostly ignorant of ancillaries. Okay, so sadly enough, RevMan teams are actually working in a bit of a black box. They're also route and flow focused, right? What does a route management team does? It manages flights. Yep, it has a route analyst. It has regional teams. Okay, the optic is certainly not the passenger, and it's certainly not the channel. Then you've got your sales and distribution guys. Now, these guys have a really tough time. They're working with imperfect data. They're trying to manage often costs to make finance happy. They're in the eternal war with revenue management because who are you going to blame for the fact that you didn't hit target? Or if you did hit target, who takes the praise because you beat target? So whether you're above target or below target, you would need to be exactly on target for there to be no friction at all between revenue management and sales or distribution. And finally, network planning. And they're backward looking. Right? The network guys are looking at last season's route results, last year's route results. They're literally a couple of years out of date, or they're at least six to 12 months out of date. You're selling forward three or four months, and you're looking backwards about six months. Okay. So what we don't see and what we make happen with our clients is we bring these guys all together to the table. Okay. And they're usually sitting around the table thinking, what are we doing here? Like, what, why is finance here? What's, what's Rev Man doing here? I mean, like, you should be with your, with your pro system doing your really complicated stuff, yeah? And the marketing guy's like, well, I don't know what I'm doing here. You know, I've got a huge ad campaign. You know, I've got a rebranding. You know, I've got a new livery. I'm really busy. And I, no, no, you're actually fundamental to, to this. And marketing is fundamental because when you choose what you want to sell to whom and through, marketing has to be there to help you. So last slide, and then please two questions. So what are a few simple things? Again, there's nothing very, very uh, exotic here that should happen. Well, the first thing is you should actually do the numbers, right? Do the numbers. Do it properly, do it well, do it all, do it at the same time, do it together, add up the numbers. Already that will be a surprise, okay? So that's a great first place for air airlines to start. Allocate the fixed costs. A lot of airlines pretend it's fixed. These are marginal costs. Don't put the fixed costs, okay? There's always someone pretending that the fixed cost isn't their budget, okay? That's another reason that airlines have these overhead issues. They don't really get these looked into carefully. Force these people together and give them some shared KPIs. They all have totally diverging KPIs. The logic behind diverging KPIs is as follows. I'm a busy chief executive. It's exhausting to deal with my C-suite or I'm a busy chief commercial officer, it's exhausting to deal with, with my department heads, and all the other consultants are saying, you need separate KPIs, everyone needs a separate KPI, we need to just, but that's crazy. That literally creates the silo. You're gonna have to make people share KPIs. You're going to need a situation where two people have failed if one number isn't the right way. Okay, two people who are peers, not in a hierarchy, but two people of different departments are going to have to be together held accountable. I would also start out with the magnitude of change that you want. Like, What is it that you're trying to go for? Is it a 0.1% reduction in distribution cost? Or is it a something percentage increase in loyal customers? Yeah. Or is it specific market share? It's like, what is it you're trying to, to do? What we observe is that finance has one set of objectives that, that it wants. Sales and distribution has another and they literally fight against each other. To get this to work, start small. And I'm not gonna use the buzzwords of agile and scrum and blah, blah. I just mean start small. I just mean just choose one thing. Get five people, put them in a room. Um, one of the most interesting uh, CEOs was Dato Idris of Malaysian, I don't know if you remember, about a decade ago, one of the turnarounds of Malaysian Airlines. He set up these things called labs, and I love this story when he tells it, and he said all his executives were coming to him, everyone was complaining, it's the other guy's fault, it's not my fault, you don't understand. And so what it is, is he brought several groups of about 10 to 15 execs to a separate floor on the building, and he had a very big room for all of them, and he would put 10 to 15 execs in a room, and he'd start off really nicely, he'd say, so you're all here together, 
to work on a shared project, and you've all been complaining to me about the other people in the room, okay? And so I just wanted you to know that here's your objective, and by the way, if you fail, probably none of you will have a job. And all sounds like, whoa, we've actually got shared incentives. That doesn't happen enough in airlines as well. A lot of heat and energy is spent of certain tribes trying to convince everyone that it's not their fault. And this brings me to the last point, which is you need to change the operating model. I don't mean change the organization. That's exhausting, it's stressful, everyone gets very tense, it gets very political, the board gets sucked into it, it just destroys energy. Yeah, but you have to find a way to get these groups to work to together, okay? So th this is what we do with, with our clients. Uh, it's only the analysis of a per passenger basis that I feel gets you to a point where you realize that depending on what the flow is and depending what channel it comes from has a huge impact on whether you're even selling something that's profitable or not, okay? That's it. Now, please, please, two questions. Even from the same person. Yes, 50% of the way there. Yes. Airlines should take more care about their own channels and rely too much on yeah, and rely too much on traditional sales channels. So, is your uh, conclusion or one of your conclusion that they should dedicate more uh, funds and time? Uh, on their own channels. Okay, so, um, good question. So, I would say, uh, and it's the same in hotels, uh, airlines and hotels tend to grossly underestimate their, the non-off, the, their own channels that are offline. So, call centers and, and sort of um, airline ticket offices. Um, they tend to think that's much cheaper at the margin, and those aren't so marginal. In terms of getting to sell through airlines.com, so now I can get a little bit, bit more into it, um, it depends an awful lot, and this is where the marketing team comes in, all right? So when, when you look at search paid and search unpaid, both of which come to your sort of brand.com, have very violently different distribution costs. Your search unpaid is when someone just goes in and types in, you know, the airline.com and it goes straight through. It's not through uh, an advertisement or, or a paid search. That is very much your marketing team that drives that. So you need to be thoughtful about, is your marketing focused on that? If you remember, when EasyJet first launched, right, they had the phone number, they had the call center phone number written on the fuselage of the early EasyJet aircraft. They then moved to easyjet.com, but that, that was a way of using the airplane and marketing to drive, if you're looking at search, search paid or, or paid search, then I think the critical thing is to bring in the loyalty team, and then it's about can you actually hook into, hook into that person. So the frequent fly guys, I, I didn't talk about them too much because that just sort of makes the whole thing ev ev even more complex. So it really depends exactly which way you're doing it, understanding your cost, and wh when, when they come in, whether to get them. I mean, look, of course, in theory, right, in theory, we don't like, you know, you know airlines say, oh, the OTAs, the big commissions. But compared to hotels, the o OTAs aren't really a huge channel. And, you know, there's a lot of inventory that, that needs to go through the OTAs. The question is, once you've sold something through an OTA, what are you going to do with that passenger? So I think the challenge is not that that single ticket sale is not the perfect decision, but what are you going to do with that passenger so that next time you have a, um, a less expensive and a higher ancillary revenue relationship? One more question, please. I just came to ask. Yeah. No? Is there someone else who has a question? Oh, my gosh. Yes. Sir. How do you foresee the, the future of the relationship between the airlines and the trade, the travel agencies and the OTAs, please? So the... The, well, um, do you mean the, uh, the travel agents which are online or, or offline? Offline. Offline, yeah. Well, look, I mean, it's remarkably resilient. I mean, travel agencies that are not online, they actually have, they're actually a big chunk of uh, European outbound point of sale. I think they've resisted quite well. I think we have a few hundred travel agencies shut down in Europe each year, but there are still many, many thousands of them, so that's going to take a long time. Um, the average yield through this channel is higher. 
And it depends where you want to put the travel management companies. So the TMC is it's kind of a sophisticated corporate leaning travel agency. I think that's a very, very robust channel that does remarkably well. I don't think this is a channel that you want to switch off. I think it's a channel that, that does have some cost, um, but it's a very valuable channel. And, and, and again, I, I think that what characterizes the dysfunction is that the conversation, as I said in my very, very first bullet point, is very much at an aggregated level where people ask these questions like, you know, what should we do about this whole channel? That whole channel? Well, it depends. In this region, in premium, here's the specific question, right? In that region, on non-premium, the answer is completely different. What's clear is you should have your incentive structure to, uh, to your indirect channels done very, very differently. I, I, I would argue that the incentive commission structures to all channels is remarkably simplistic. In fact, remarkably simplistic, given that airlines keep these very complicated machines up in the air very safely, but for some reason we think that you're gonna apply the same percentage or ratcheted scale of commissions, regardless of who the passenger is, what flight they're on, what class they're on, blah, blah, blah. I mean, most agency deals are remarkably simple, and we've not gotten much more sophisticated in the last 40 years, I'd say. Okay, I, I answered two questions. My, my day is full. Thank you.